Hey everyone, welcome back to the People Process Progress Podcast. I am Kevin Pinnell. I really appreciate you all hitting play on this episode, finding me on your various podcast platforms. Um, today, I'm going to cover Leading in the Wildland Fire Service, which is a manual created in 2007 um, by the National Wildfire Coordinating Group uh, with their training team there and by Mission Centered Solutions Incorporated. It was one of the leadership manuals that on episode 10 and in one of the archives from between the slides here, so go check that out, um, where I covered leadership lessons from Gettysburg and beyond. So this manual, as the title entails, is focused on folks coming up in the incident management world, and in particular in the wildland fire service. And we use this manual, even though we weren't wildland firefighters, because we were all hazards folks. So please, firefighters, EMS, public health, um, wherever that lives kind of in the regular day-to-day world on the streets of America. <clears throat> um, but this was a great template, and wildland fire has been around for a while, and they have great leadership stuff set up. So this was a pre-read before that, that staff ride at Gettysburg National Battlefield. And I thought, you know, we've talked about COVID and public health and those kind of things, and hopefully that's been helpful. But also want to, you know, my day job is I'm a project manager, and so I wanted to share some of the parallels, which I've talked about before, between just good leadership in whatever industry. And in this particular case, looking through this leading in the wild and fire service manual and applying it to project management. And you all will see whether you're a project manager or not, or you're an incident management or public safety, the parallels. I mean, again, I've said it before, to me, good leadership or a good leader can transcend any industry. Meaning if you're a good leader, I could plop you in technology or public safety or healthcare or farming, but you would be able to bring together teams. You would be able to facilitate some kind of process. You're not going to be the expert in each of those, but that's you know often not the leader's job. And so let's let's get into this book a little bit. I'm gonna I'm gonna <clears throat> read some of these things uh, and then kind of comment on them and then look forward to y'all's comments. Um, if you want to send me stuff directly, I'm at peopleprocessprogress at gmail.com or uh, Facebook page People Process Progress. You can get a hold of me there or on Instagram Penel KG. Here we go. So this is part of the preface of the book uh, very early on, and there's a couple statements that I think are really outstanding. And the first is that leadership is the art of influencing people in order to achieve a result. The most essential element for success in the wild and fire service is good leadership. So let me touch on that last piece, but switch out a couple words. The most essential element for success in project management is good leadership. Right. There, there's there's no difference, you know, saying from I'm a person whose job it is to go out and help put thousands of acres that are burning out that are on fire or I'm a person that's going to help get an organization put thousands of devices out that work well. Right. Good leadership is, you know, the, one, the most essential element. Here's another statement. And this one just applies all around. Right. Leaders often face difficult problems to which there are no simple, clear cut by the book solutions. In these situations, leaders must use their knowledge, skill, experience, education, values and judgment to make decisions and to take or direct action. In short, to provide leadership. So project managers out there, think about that. Right. We you know, part of bringing together a new project team or coming into a project that's already in flight is getting together, looking at solutions that, you know, I've said it uh, ad nauseum, but, you know, I'll say it again, the project management body of knowledge is a great manual, but if you try and manage projects strictly by using that book or, you know, Agile Guide or Six Sigma, like if you just try and do completely out of the box, and I've seen some of this where, you know, we're trying to apply principles that we would normally apply when it's a sunny day and there's no pandemic and all that, then we're going to fail. We're going to spin our wheels a little bit. And so be okay with everything not being, you know, exactly like it is in the book. And some of that comes with experience, right? So if you've, if you've been around a little bit in life, you kind of understand that, let alone if you're new in project management or have been around there, you understand it's not going to go by the book ever. It's not even going to go by your project plan exactly ever. And that's fine. Just do the best that you can for all the constraints and, and this and that. So as the manual goes through, um, then we're going to look at some some leadership values and principles. And these are like human leadership values and principles, right? But think of these as a project manager and, and the three values that are outlined that this book kind of everything else falls under are duty, respect, and integrity. So 
according to the you know leading in the wild and fire service um which you know we could rename this and change some things it could be leading and project management so let's look at duty be proficient uh to both technically as a, and as a leader these these apply to duty these are the principles that apply to the value of duty uh make sound and timely decisions um make sure that the tasks are understood supervised and accomplished right and develop your people you know all of those apply directly if you're a project manager, if you're a project manager that's invested in your team, you're invested in being the best person, the best leader that you can be, then all of those should be absolutely, you know, and the proficient in your job piece to me is, do you know how to use the tools that your organization uses, right? Or do you stumble through them or refuse to use them? Be proficient in them. Get get good with them to the point where you can try to then leverage them to make solutions for certain things, like you know being able to stand up very quickly a way to track phones you've deployed, or you know using Excel or using Project Online or a SharePoint list or whatever product you use. Um, you know, sound and timely decisions. I've talked before again on that that um, I think it was episode 10 from the archive there with Gettysburg Leadership about the time wedge, right? The the longer the time goes down, the less options we have. So we gotta we gotta be ready to make those. When we get to the task level and the overall project schedule, do we know that the folks that that have you know the resources, the people that we have on our team that are assigned to tasks that have taken on those tasks, do we know what they're supposed to do and what when we've asked them to do it by and how to do it? Um, and if the answer is no, then you know we need to make sure and and uh, that we can clear that up. And part of our jobs as project managers along the way from, you know, day one when you introduce yourself to when you're handed it off to operational support is developing your people. So are your teammates coming out the other end of the project better? Are you also? And I, and I think we should always look at that. The second value here, respect, um, and here's the principle. So know your people and their well-being. Uh, now, you know, in this time is a an excellent opportunity to develop this if you're maybe not as heavy in this as a project manager is check in on your team how are you doing how's your family are you getting enough rest do you need any help let me know you know if you need more people do we need to up staff if we can to help give you a break like that should be a constant cycle a constant check-in with our, our teammates keep your people informed we've all been part of silos or you know i copied these people on the email but not these other people you know what Cut down on emails and copy folks. And if someone says, hey, I don't need to know this, just work with my people, awesome, then cut down. But there's really, unless you're actually working in top secret, you know, secured compartmental information, skip stuff, like none of this is top secret, right? So we should be open, have good communications, and, and keep our entire team informed at all levels. Um, there's, you know, one thing I've heard a lot on calls I've been, and, and it's when, you know, folks use the term, well, we'll talk about that offline, which, you know, partially sometimes if you've been on those calls means I don't want to talk about this in front of everyone else. You and I can just talk about it somewhere else. Now there's utility in that when in a, a quick update meeting, we're not going to get into a working session. That makes sense. Hey, you know what? Let's dive into this deeper offline so we can work through that. That makes total sense. You should be doing that anyway. When folks don't want to talk about something and you can tell through the conversation that there's already other silos happening in the project, um, that's something that you should be aware of as a project manager and that you should you should maybe address. Like, hey, I noticed you guys wanted to talk about this offline. Is you know, is there some information that I can help with or that maybe the rest of the team needs to know? And, you know, just kind of reach out. Again, there shouldn't be a ton of separate discussions that don't relate to everybody else on the team and the objectives that the project is trying to meet, right? If it's truly unified, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, this other principle that has to do with respect is build the team, right? Your job as a project manager, whether you've been matrixed and they actually report to you, or most often I've found like no one actually works for you, but your job is to build the team up so that folks want to do work for the project or you, if you've built those relationships through you reaching out to them directly, through talking to them, through active listening, all this, all, you know, some of the other things we'll get into about good leadership, but part of your job is not just build, get people to get the job done. It's build the team to be cohesive. Employ your people in accordance with their capabilities. This is the last of the principles for the value of respect here in the, in, in this table in the leading in the wildland fire service. Um, so, you know, when you work through asking for people for resources for the project, make sure that they're aligned and have that discussion with the resource managers and with them. Hey, are you comfortable with this assignment? Is there any other information you need? Do we need to ask somebody else and just rely on your experts to help drive, you know, who needs to do what jobs, right? 
The third of the values was integrity, is integrity. Um, the first principle is seek improvement, right? So as a project manager, every project I try and get better, whether I, I actively always do that, which I, I try to do, or, you know, every project you do, you're going to learn something new about some new product or process or the people in the organization or something, right? So by default, you're getting better. And if you can even push that a little further and say, well, you know what, for this time, I'm going to use this new form that we're starting to use. And I'm going to try and fill out every single task or update or, you know, just really kind of refine your schedule, refine your task details or less details, you know, whatever it is to make your project more efficient. We should be seeking uh, responsibility and accepting responsibility. This is the second of the principles with the integrity value. That, to me, speaks to the, uh, you know, I've mentioned Jocko Willink, and you all may be familiar with him that listen, uh, extreme ownership, right? So as a leader, no bad teams, only bad leaders. So if we are project managers that are proactive, that want to be successful for ourselves, for our families, for our organizations, for all those different reasons, then we should seek out chances to have responsibility, right? We should want to be the person that's chosen to go help other people when they're having issues. We should also openly accept responsibility when we fall short, even if our teammates fall short, right? If it's if it's our team that we're facilitating, facilitating a process for and that we're helping, you know, some of that responsibility lies on us. And the last is set the example. No one's perfect. Sometimes you'll be cranky. Sometimes you'll be tired. Whether you had your coffee or not, stayed up late, what's going on, especially now, right? We're in this long, drawn-out time of remote work, and even though I've been working remotely uh, 100% for almost a year, it's a lot to not be able to drive around as much or go different places, And you know. but set the example. So, you know, a couple episodes ago, I, I gave the examples of, of good telework, of, you know, put yourself in that mode of, I'm going to get up, I'm going to exercise, I'm going to get dressed for the day, I'm going to have my breakfast, I'm going to work like I would if I was in the office. I have three kids at home, my wife's also working from home, so I totally get it. We're also trying to balance, you know, being school teachers, which on its own is amazingly difficult, so shout out to all the school teachers for helping us keep going. But we have to we have to have a routine, we have to set the example. And throughout a project, we also should do the things I talked about before, the other principles that apply to the values of duty, respect, and integrity, and try and be that example because there are a lot of eyes on us as project managers, both from our supervisors, from their supervisors, from organizational leaders, from the members of the team. And that's fine. That's that's part of our gig. So the next piece I wanted to touch on. Um, has to do with kind of becoming a leader and why people choose to be a leader. Um, you know, and, and I'm going to read another statement. And, and again, I'm going to swap out terms. Um, so fire leaders bring order to chaos, improve other people's lives, and strengthen our organizations. Leading enables us to leave a legacy for the leaders of the future so that they can take our place as well, prepared for the road ahead. These are the rewards of leadership. Their effects will be seen and felt long after our careers end. So why be a project manager, right? Why do you choose to lead? Why, you know, do we lead because we want to make a difference? How do you bring or how have you brought um, order to chaos, right? If you come into, um, like I have a few times both in my incident management, you know, planning session chief hat, but certainly as a project manager where people are ordering stuff, they're doing things all over the place in different processes and you're asked, hey, go help them out. Let's see what's happening. That is how we as project managers bring order to chaos. Start with the discussion. I've talked a lot and 100% believe it, and I've talked on a few other podcasts, uh, which is cool, that will be coming out soon about those foundational four, right? At, at, at a minimum, help get objectives quickly, see what the organizational chart is, see who's who, see what resources are available, or get some and communicate. Start there and all the other tools and methodologies and whatever else will come along with it. Um, you know, and, and you do see rewards from that. You'll see rewards from the order that you've brought to maybe a chaotic situation and you're reducing people's stress and you're making the organization more efficient and you're helping save some money. And, you know, that that is a great reward of being an effective leader uh, or project manager in this case. Right. Um, so that, you know, that first part of the statement I read about fire leaders bring order to chaos. Well, project managers bring order to chaos. That's a huge part of what we do or what we should be doing. So here's a couple more statements about 
you know, leadership and bringing teams together. And again, this is the wildland fire service version. In the wildland fire service, firefighters, dispatchers, managers, technicians, support services, medical staff, law enforcement, the military, and others are brought together in rapidly assembled temporary teams to accomplish a given mission. These teams have unique capabilities, limitations, qualifications, and experience. Let's do a switcheroo. In project management, analysts, technicians, financial professionals, human resources, clinical engineering folks are brought together in rapidly assembled teams, dot, 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 right? Same thing. We are going to show up. We're going to bring together folks that may not normally work together or sometimes they have worked together. And that's a great opportunity, just like leaders in the wildland fire service do. You know, our wildfire, so to speak, and project management is this process we're brought to improve or this this gap in a capability that the organization doesn't have that by you facilitating a good process are going to bring together all these different uh professionals and subject matter experts to help fill to get these new devices in the environment and really make that difference. Uh, another thing that I think directly applies and we'll switch it out here is fire leaders must have the ability to integrate these varied resources into effective and responsive temporary teams. Project managers must have the ability to integrate these varied resources, etc. Right. You have to be able to bring various teams together so let's look at that for a second so as a project manager you're typically bringing a team together right even though it's made of folks from different departments vendors internal external regulations privacy whoever you're bringing together but it's usually like a project team and again i'm a huge advocate for i don't i don't even like the verbiage of well the vendor project team and our project there's one project team right there should always just be one team if you take that up a level if you have multiple projects under the heading of like a program, there should also be a program leader, a program manager that has clearly defined with leadership. Here is the org structure overall and the objectives overall. Here are the resources overall. Here's the communication overall. And at the project level, here's what's going on with project one, two, three, and four that are all related that, that come into a program. When you don't do that under a program level, you're going to have these cylinders of excellence or these silos. And while the projects may talk to each other, there's no cohesiveness in the work that they're doing. So project managers or program managers must have the ability to integrate those teams together or the people on a singular team uh, to stay effective. Here we're going to jump to, again, very heavy on the, the unity of effort in leadership. So this speaks to but we all working together, kind of what I talked about. If you if you have a program, but you have projects kind of doing their own thing and then, you know, developing their own processes, but they're actually linked together, um, then you don't truly have unity of effort, meaning everybody's working together. Um, here's some great, you know, great statement about um, about that or, or issues with that is the longer it takes to develop a unified effort, the greater the vacuum of leadership. Delays increase confusion, which in turn magnify the risk to our people and increase the likelihood that people will take unproductive or independent action without understanding the larger intent. There you have it. Clear objectives, right? If we all develop clear objectives, and, I, and I've talked to some folks and, and read some comments, uh, I think on Reddit or other places, where some folks have are having issues with getting people together to get clear objectives. Well, if that's the case, as a project manager, a program manager, or other leader, just put some objectives together and ideally you're developing those with other people. But if, if you can't get people together, if it's either, you know, you can't get folks together to help develop combined objectives or they're not sticking to them, then help put them together, present them kind of lead up, which we'll talk about in a little bit and, and put some out there, right? Don't start with just a blank slate, um, start with some good examples and they don't have to be perfect. You can refine, refine them as you go. And this really applies at all levels. So, if within your team you have silos, that's not good. If with within different projects under a program you have silos, that's not good. If in the entire organization you have whole programs or whole departments or divisions trying to solve the same problem and you haven't helped streamline that process yet, then you're you're spinning wheels from people's time and money and and, and you know in a time like now uh, we all don't have a lot of that, right? So. One thing kind of wherein both the, the project manager and, and incident management hat, planning section chief had is, you know, one thing that we should be seeing, hopefully, and if not a, a good chance to improve on the fly is, do we have a truly unified command at our organization? Is there unity of effort where we streamline 
solutions for big problems that are happening in our organizations or an information sharing. Um, and if not, take a look at that and, and help make sure that this unified effort, this unity of effort is happening from the individual project level or small team level up to the highest level of your organization with you know whatever you're working on. As you do this, as you influence, as you help as a project manager come into a situation or you know talk to leaders in your organization, uh, something that should be very important and you should be conscious of is your command presence, right? Command presence in public safety and the wildland fire is, uh, you know, no different than it could be with you as a project manager walking into a meeting or doing a kickoff meeting or, you know, just meeting with folks. And it doesn't mean you're, you know, totally in someone's face in their space, but it does mean, which, you know, we've mentioned, and Jordan Peterson has a great, you know, comments on this as part of his rules of life is head up, shoulders back, be confident, believe in yourself, believe in your organization. It makes a huge difference. On the street, running calls, doing scenarios, it's an absolute must. Sometimes you have to raise your voice so folks can hear you, not ask questions. As a project manager, sometimes you know we have to be very direct as well. Uh, in a business environment, it's different. You're not on the street you know, in your boots and uniform and stuff, and, and it's different people. But here's a great statement about that from the Wildland Fire Service. And then again, we'll, we'll translate this because it, it directly applies to project management. More than anything else, the leader's command presence sets the tone for the command climate. Command presence is how we present ourselves to others. The myriad of personal attributes and behaviors that communicates to others that we are worthy of their trust and respect. Right. So as a project manager, are you meeting folks with confidence at all levels? If you shake the CEO's hand, are you just as confident as when you shake the analyst that's going to do the programming's hand? And if you're not, why? Right. Is it the environment that the leader has set where, you know, they're they're boisterous and, and not making folks comfortable? Or is it you? Are you not confident in your skills or in your abilities or just your personality? But that's another area as we improve ourselves every time, you know, and the opposite. Are you too confident sometimes? I know I find myself in there where I have to humble myself a little bit more and, and take stock in that. But look at how you are. Look at how you approach folks, your body language, um, how you feel inside before you go into a meeting. Um, and balancing, you know, arrogance with being timid. So where's the middle ground there, right? Don't be a pushover because your job is to facilitate process to make sure folks are doing what they need to do, that we're accomplishing those objectives, that we're, you know, on time, on budget, all that good stuff. But then also, it's also not your job to tell everyone what they're supposed to do at every level, right? If you were the expert in everything, you would just do every project instead of having to bring teams together. That's, that's a big difference. Um, when you're a project manager, you also need to take charge when you're in charge, right? So we as project managers are empowered with the either direct, you know, supervision and, and some of that's perception, right? There's, there's a lot of folks I've worked with that say, well, you're the project manager, you tell me. And, you know, one of the first things they say is, sure, if it's a decision on do we spend that money, can we extend the scope, do you need me to help get obstacles out of we? Absolutely, I'm going to help do that. If it's a how do we do something to solve a problem for a task um, or how do you know to, how do you work with your teammate I turn around and say no, no no I help facilitate the process and put the plan together you tell me what we need to do and if there's someone that you need to work with I'm happy to set that up but but you really need to work directly with them because you know as a project manager oftentimes we are the middle people right that that sometimes, though, become a crutch for others. Well, I can't talk to them. You need to do that. You're the project manager. Well, no, I'm in charge. Part of being in charge is I'm going to hold you accountable to do some work yourself, right? And, and that's totally fine. But as a project manager, um, particularly if you're new, you may not be comfortable doing that to someone that's been at that organization for like 10, 20 years, but you need to be, right? Our job isn't to make people communicate with other people from the standpoint of just getting up, you know, and walking around the corner or making a phone call, you know, and, and I've, I've had the extreme of, of that. Every little step I was asked to do versus totally self-driving teams that just took care of it themselves and worked with their peers. So as a project manager, you know, and, and this example is the, the fire service, you know, when you're in charge, make those decisions and help out. But as a project manager, you know, you do need to be in charge when you're given that responsibility, but you also need to let other people do some of the work because you're, you're not there to really do it. And, and part of that balance is how are you inspiring your teams without having direct 
supervision control. They don't work for you day to day, right? And now all of a sudden they've all come together in a team. So how are you motivating them? Are you motivating them by giving them some space, by setting them up for success, by talking to them, by asking them about, you know, more than just the thing that they need to do for your project, like a person, right? That's a huge, uh, a huge thing that, um, you know, project managers need to be able to do is communicate with people. And if, if you're not a people person, it's, I would imagine if you're project managing and listening to this and you're not a people person, that's quite a challenge. So use project management if you can as an opportunity to improve on that. So moving into now about halfway through the book, as project managers, we are leaders for sure, right? And so when we have that command presence, when we're building our teams, part of making sure that everyone has the same vision that they know our end state, they know what we're doing is that our leader's intent is clear. And so this book, the, the Leading in the Wild and Fire Service, does a great job with three key things looking at the task, purpose, and the end state, right? And so the first thing with task that, that's here in the book and then we'll talk about for project managers what is the objective or goal of the assignment? There it is again, right? Objectives, right? We ha we all should work from those and, and we should work from smart objectives. Every project, every program, every initiative should have those. Some people call them goals. Some people call, you know, they're a little bit different. Smart objectives are clear cut. It's where we want to do this stuff by this time within this amount of time, right? Something like that. Um, they're specific, right? measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-based, and that we are managing our tasks. So that's pretty straightforward. You know, it's tasks, but there's task management. So as a project manager, are we keeping track of the tasks or group of tasks or however you've broken out your schedule and making sure that you're supporting folks that are, you know, responsible for getting them done or giving them the resources they need? The other part of intent, the second thing of leader's intent is purpose, right? So why the assignment needs to be done. And in the wild and fire world or even in you know public safety and public health, it's pretty straightforward. We need to put the fire out so the house doesn't burn down. We need to dig this fire line so that it doesn't go past it and burn the neighborhood down as well then, right? In project management, the why we're doing something is just as important. And it's a huge principle in that change management, that ad car, right? It's A, the awareness of why do we need to change this process? Well, because there's these inefficiencies, we can save time, we can save staffing. Why do we need these new devices? Well, the other ones are gonna be end of life, they won't be supported and they keep breaking, right? There's all these different things. There's also, you know, with Simon Sinek, who I've talked about, he has this golden circle model and in the center of that is why, and then there's how, and then there's what. It's like, it looks like a target. So with that, it's, you know, with his concept, it's very similar or the same, but it, but it's more, you know, I work in healthcare project management in IT, right? So often the, the why is really to improve patient outcomes. You could latch on to any why statement, right? To um, make nurses uh, gathering vital signs more efficient by automating the process to improve patient outcomes, right? So you could, you could apply that to anything. Think of that in your industry and, and similar. And so that really is a more meaningful why so if we are going to save time and we can have more nurse to patient time because they're taking less time to do a certain, you know, task, then that's huge, particularly if it's your family member that's the patient that now has more focus on them that may catch an arrhythmia, you know, an irregular heartbeat or lung sounds or something like that um, because we're not overwhelmed. And so that's a very tangible why. So as project managers, consider that also. And it doesn't have to be healthcare, right? Across all other industries, there are very tangible whys that result in a life improvement for someone or something. So maybe think about how you can tie to that. Um, the end state. So task, purpose, end state for leader's intent. End state is how the situation should look when the assignment is successfully completed. Right? What is the clear uh, alignment of stuff that's in scope for the project? What is the clear misalignment for stuff that's out of scope? Right. Here are things we're going to focus on or organizations included. Here are things that we are not or organizations not included. And another good addition, particularly in a lot of the stuff you're capturing in your charter early, early on, or even in you know the business case, um, you know, whichever stage your development honestly is from your project management office. But if you already know, you know, what's in scope, what's out of scope also, how are you going to measure success for this? So the end state should look like not just the number of devices in the environment, but also the uh, increase in efficiency of X or the reduction in time spent doing Y, 
right? So you want to define those early on so that when you have all these objectives with tasks, when you know the purpose of what needs to be done and who's going to do it, then you're working also toward here's what we want to look at. And some of these end states, um, some are pretty specific and, and you'll know right away, like number of new things in the environment, you'll know whether that was done or not. What you may not know are the operational efficiencies, right? So did we actually make it better that may, for a project, there may be some lag time for the examples here in the wildfire service, you know, or, or wildfire, um, you know, if the fire has gone out, if there's, um, you know, the line has been dug and it's complete and it stopped the fire. That's a pretty immediate feedback. And there's still other factors like weather and things like that. But for a project, sometimes there's a lag in actually seeing the full um, measures of success uh, or areas for improvement. And so set up, you know, some kind of post project time operational support um, triggers, if you will, or ways to monitor it, reports and things like that. And then you can continually monitor that end state. So as a good leader, we know we need to have good command presence. We need to be in charge when we should be in charge, develop our teams. And and that's a part that, that the book dives into very well um, is developing our people for the future. And again, you know, we should all come out on the other side of a project, a program, a response, anything better, um, you know, in, in some aspect. And a great uh, portion on mentoring states that leaders also help their people grow by mentoring and sharing experiences. Mentoring them begins their journey from followership to leadership, right? And, and so here's, here's the next paragraph after that uh, is fire leaders coach and then step back to allow people to take on new responsibilities. Providing the opportunity to test new waters and try new behaviors is important in developing people for the future. Switch out fire leaders, project managers, coach, and then step back, right? So yes, we're going to be pretty active on setting up the regular team syncs. Yep, we're going to keep track of things in whatever system we need to. Um, but we're also going to look at the team and see who's on there. Do we have some folks with pretty good experience that can help drive the entire process because they've done this before or a similar project? Just because you're the project manager doesn't mean you have the last word all the time or need to. Um, you know, a lot of your time should be spent listening and making sure you have the message um, unless there's a point where things are getting missed. Um, teams aren't taking responsibility, that kind of stuff. But it's a great opportunity also, depending on who's in your project management office, of seeing if there's other folks in your office that want to help or that you've brought in, brought in to help. And asking what they want to do, like, what, what do you want to do? What can I help with? And not just coming in and, and kind of taking over. So, you know, let the teams lead themselves when you can, like we mentioned earlier. And, and one of the best statements I've heard with that uh, is trust, but verify, right? I'm going to trust you because we're on the same team. We're working the same project, but I'm going to check on things, right? Because I have to, as a, as a project manager, you're, you're ultimately responsible for a lot of the stuff in the project. So you definitely want to trust folks to get things done, but you're going to have to verify that they've gotten done. And, you know, were they done per the specifications of our project, per alignment with our objectives? So that's a good opportunity there as we're mentoring and, again, looking for, you know, folks within our project management office, folks within the project team. Um, looking at people's skill levels and some projects have been part in uh, or part of, you know, there was actually official training that was an opportunity to get for folks that were both during the project and afterwards going to be supporting it operationally. So now if you can get them officially trained and certified in a new product, that's outstanding. That's a bonus that enables an entire team, let alone individual people, um, you know, on how they can get better for next time. So empowering people isn't just people that I guess you could say are subordinates if they're reporting to us on a project or colleagues, but they're matrix to us. It also is empowering and those above us, right? Those, those that have signed on that are sponsors, that are leaders of the organization, of the department, of whatever it is that you're helping with. And one thing that I've always done, I think because I've had great leaders that encouraged open dialogue is lead up or manage up. That means you are not the ultimate one in charge, which there's always someone above everyone, really. But as a project manager, are you comfortable giving feedback that isn't always great or perfect or saying no or I don't think we should to your direct boss, your boss's boss, the C-suite, right, everyone else, and speaking up when you see clear misalignment throughout a project that you know is already negatively affecting the project or the program and bringing things up on a call or in person 
that's a project manager's job is, is leading up. And so I'm going to read a statement from there uh, on page 48 from Leading in the Wild and Fire Service. Looking out for people includes not only those who work for us, but also our leaders and peers. Leadership is about influencing others to accomplish tasks that are in the best interest of our organization. This often means influencing those above us and leading up. Similarly, we are open to upward leadership and, in fact, encourage and reward it. Open to upward, meaning our egos are out of the way, we're not in our silo. So those folks that are the analysts, right, that may say, hey, maybe we could do this a little better. Hey, I'm not getting the communications that your ego as a project manager or your belief that everything is just so clear and you're doing so good doesn't get in the way of the fact that you have a person on your team that isn't getting the message. There's nothing more clear than that, that your communication is not 100%. Now with leading up, you have to read your environment. Right? Is your environment open where you know that your supervisor or your C-suite is all about open conversation and they're comfortable with it and they're comfortable with feedback? That doesn't mean they're going to have to take action on everything you say. You also shouldn't be naysaying them all the time. right? Or is the environment that they don't really want to hear from you? And that was from you know some of the leadership I talked about in Gettysburg where you know these lieutenants were telling the generals, hey, I don't think we can take that ridge. It's not safe. Or, oh, we can take it. And, and then the high-level leaders would say, you know what, if I wanted a lieutenant's opinion, and this is like a general, brigadier general, I, I would give it to you kind of thing. If you're in that environment, it's a whole different thing. Then you have to lead up a little less directly, right? Lead up through leading your project team and doing the right thing which may not always be 100% with what exactly that leader wants. Um, Because sometimes the leader may not know best, but the folks on the project team do, and they're closer to it, right? So if a leader comes into a program or a project and they think, well, I heard there was a problem from some people, I'm going to just jump right in here and take over. Well, one, there's probably been a lot of work done already to build off of. Two, that does not help the morale of the team at all. And... If people are frustrated and they start calling out specific people on a call, you know, be the project or program manager that calls them on it, that stops that because that's a morale killer like right there and you have to be comfortable doing it. And, and I think most folks will appreciate that later on, um, but you have to know what the environment is. You know, if it's, if it's open or if you're working with folks and they are clearly kind of gun shy about, oh, if I mess up, this or that will happen, then you, know, you have to think about, okay, they're dealing with leadership that is probably not super supportive, that is maybe jumping on them a little too much. Whether you can change that or not, you know, is a whole different thing. But what you can do is make their experience with your project team the best that it can be and support them from that aspect and offer to get out there, right? Offer to help be the obstacle or be, you know, the, the kind of protection between them and maybe some feedback they're getting on leadership that may not understand, you know, hey, why, why are you not getting this done on the project? But they may not understand the full story. And a lot of that just comes back to open communication between all the parties and all the levels involved about, you know, leading back up through you for people on your project team by letting them know, hey, you know, so-and-so is doing a great job on our team, actually, and we really appreciate their guidance. Here here are some challenges that we're running into, um, you know, because sometimes folks don't ask for help early enough to help get work done. And so sometimes you do have to step in and help them uh, kind of help themselves and help their leadership. So as we move through uh, about on page 50 out of 60 something uh, of the manual and been going for a little bit. I, again, I just want to thank everybody for listening, for reaching out on Instagram at penlkg. Um, or peopleprocessprogress.com, People Process Progress Facebook group. Um, we look forward to hear your feedback on how are your projects going, what are challenges you're facing. Uh, also on LinkedIn in the COVID-19 response, uh, or ra- rather knowledge area group, or just directly, uh, Kevin Pinnell on LinkedIn. So we've talked about building the team. We've talked about leading up. Um, so when I go through some specific examples that are in the manual about building the team, kind of some of the subheaders that are in there that I think are really helpful. And again, is as project managers, some steps that we could use that we could consider that we could make actionable um, as we help now in this, you know, crazy COVID-19 response time. And then, you know, really forever as project managers. And so building the team that the first one of these subheadings is trust, right? So trust comes from, being given from being earned. Um, there's so many different guides and, and things on trust. And for me, 
as a project manager, uh, again, it comes down to just, you know, being straightforward with other people and giving them respect and not jumping all over them if they're not perfect. And all the things that you would build trust with any other human, you know, do that as a project manager. Healthy conflict is the second of these. And, you know, that sounds kind of like a misnomer, but there, there is there is opportunity in having conflict with others healthily, right? Meaning you can have your opinion, you can have your stress on, on the, when the tasks do or, or when we have to have things do, or, you know, as a project manager, you just may have a better comfort or insight on some regulatory thing that we have to do that may conflict with other people's schedules, right? Just because a regulation came in that affects a project you have to do doesn't take away all the other work that people on your project team have to do. So sometimes, especially if it's a scheduling or resource uh, conflict, and, you know, those are plenty now, um, you have to help push and work through that. And sometimes this healthy conflict results in escalation, right? In escalation to the point of where you have to say, you know what, we're going to have to get our leaders to kind of settle this for us and make the decision. But that's what leaders are for, right? Be in charge when you are in charge. And so leading up part of that when we're building our team is, hey, we're at an impasse. I'm not getting results. Um, we really need your support in this. And, and then, you know, lay out all the facts that your leadership can help make that decision. Uh, commitment, right? So we have to be committed. Uh, the third of these building the team guides from uh, leadership and the Wild and Fire Service, we got to be committed to our projects, right? Sometimes we're tired. We don't feel like it. It's been a long project, long weeks, especially now. But we have to have that commitment because our commitment will show in our documentation and our attitude and the way we speak to people. Uh, and again, it'll wax and wane, right? But just always come back to what's the overall objective of this project and how does it affect the patients, the people, the organization. And a good way to help build commitment within your team is, again, that delegation for your teammates. Um, peer accountability, right? You as a project manager are going to manage tasks, you know, in whatever tools we talked about or whatever tools you use, but you also are going to manage people, lead people, partner with people, and you have to hold them accountable. And this is tough, you know, <clears throat> calling folks out, you know, it's that same kind of human principle is praise in public, you know, punish in private. And you may not be technically punishing someone, but if you need to have a direct conversation like, hey, we're, you know, we're coming up on this go live and the work that you're assigned is, is you know, lacking, What what's going on? And it shouldn't be a surprise, right? So you should see this coming. You should know what's going on if you're keeping track of your tasks. Um, but you need to have that one on one conversation and then start that discussion of, well, you know, we really need to do this. Do you need me to help? ask for more people to help you. Do you need me to help um, have your leadership clear your schedule more? Like what, what can I do because you don't work for me all the time to basically help you get the job done? How can I help empower that? Um, and if it's still not happening and you're not getting a response, that's when you do need to reach out to their supervisor and escalate and, and do all the things that, that, you know, is part of that difficult, healthy conflict stuff, but is, is huge. Cause we, we do need to be responsible. Same thing for you as a project manager. If you're not getting it done, and you're getting called out and they're like, well, I told Kevin and he didn't follow up on it to own it and say, you know what? I did miss that. I'm sorry. I apologize. And, you know, try and get better. Uh, team results, right? So the whole focus of being a project manager is building a team, fostering a team, facilitating process for a team, you know, team, team, team. And so these are team results. These are not your results. And, and even when folks say when we do project reports or I get praise or, you know, punished with whichever and it's, well, Kevin's project, it's, I am the first to say, this is not my project. You know, the team did this, our project, the organization's project, right? You know, unless you're the owner of the company, you're the startup, you're the whatever, you don't own any of the stuff that you're being a project manager for, right? You're in there helping people work together to do something. So make sure you always focus on that. Resilience. How are you building resilience in your team? Or are you, right? And, and resilience from, are you taking care of each other? You're talking to each other, clearly defining those roles. Are you track, tracking what's happening? Where are you uh, on those regular sinks? And one thing I found that, that I think built great teamwork and resilience in the team is, is short and succinct check-in meetings every week. And I, I mean like 15 minutes, right? Like Because if we're resilient, if we're talking to each other, if we're holding each other accountable, we'll focus on team results, we are, we are talking to each other all the time anyway, not just once a week. And, and that's the thing I've found too in you know, project or program calls that, that I've heard 
is people try and do everything all on one call, meaning have those difficult discussions, try and move forward with work, like everything, like a call that's a weekly call should be a, a check-in that's short and efficient, not a long drawn out call. It's clear. It's super obvious when no talk has happened between meetings and, and they try and have all the talk in the meeting. Right. Or so make sure that we're, you know, we're always looking at each other and, and with that resilience. And I did a whole episode on contingency planning, but that's something each project, each project manager should think about. What if the staff is unavailable? What if I'm unavailable? You know, how do you have contingencies in place for you? And, <clears throat> excuse me, or do you, you know, have you talked to your supervisor like, Hey, I need to be out, uh, or, you know, take a vacation or all those kind of things, but we have to set up some resiliency, some redundancy within our project teams to keep them going forward. And boy, is that ever true now, right? Everybody's in continuity of operations, continuity of a government continuity of whatever mode, uh, we're running out of stuff. We're running out of people to rotate in cause we're exhausted, but there's always a way just make sure you plan ahead. You know, how do we staff up? How do we rotate staff? Um, and, and just work through that resiliency in your planning. So we are a little bit shy of an hour, about 45 minutes now. And I want to just honestly, on, on one of the last pages of, of this manual, this leading in the wild and fire service, which I believe could be, you know, leading in project management. If you just change out some of the, the verbiage in here is the eyes forward statement at the end. And that's how I'm going to close out this episode. Again, I thank you all so much for listening. Please subscribe. Please rate and review. Please share with other people if this is helpful. Um, really appreciate the feedback. Uh, contact me directly, peopleprocessprogress at gmail.com. Um, thank you very much. Let's look at eyes forward. And I'm going to replace wildland or fire service with project management. But no, if you find this leading in the wildland fire service manual from 2007 or newer publications of it, uh, it will say wildland fire service, but I am going to on the fly adapt it for us project managers. Eyes forward. Leaders in project management chose to reach beyond the challenges of learning the craft of project management by stepping forward to lead people in complex and dangerous environments. Project management leaders trade the indulgencies of complacency, second guessing, and fault finding for the responsibilities of bringing order out of chaos, improving our people, and building our organizations. As our careers progress, some move from being a leader of people to being a leader of leaders to being a leader of an organization. At each level, we rise to meet the challenges of adhering to our values of duty, respect, and integrity and assume the responsibility of instilling those values in others. A leader's accomplishments are measured in lifetimes. Our character, decisions, and actions create powerful ripple effects that continue to influence people and organizations long after we are gone. This is the legacy that each generation passes on and entrusts to our successors. Thank you all very much for listening. Stay safe out there, and Godspeed.